Hello and welcome to this session of Maritime Medicine in which we will discuss shock. By the end of this session, you'll be able to define shock, identify and list eight common causes of shock, and appropriately treat a patient in shock based on the cause of their shock. So shock is not a disease. Shock is a common end pathway of many diseases, and it's defined as inadequate end organ tissue perfusion. Well, what does this mean? Perfusion is your body's ability using the mechanisms in place to deliver glucose and oxygen in blood to an organ. And so shock would be inability of the body to deliver glucose and oxygen in blood to organs. There are four components that you need to have intact to ensure perfusion. You need to have blood, so volume, and in that you need to have oxygen and glucose. So if you don't have enough blood, if you don't have enough oxygen, or you don't have enough glucose, you can't perfuse organs. You need to have a heart as a pumping mechanism to push the blood around, and you need to have vessels to carry the blood. In your body, your basic unit of life is your cell. It's the smallest, what we would consider sort of an individual living entity. And they need energy to stay alive. And they generate this energy by basically chemically burning glucose with oxygen. Combine the two, they make carbon dioxide, just the same as if you were to burn a piece of wood. And the energy that they generate from doing that, they store in something called ATP. So if there's no oxygen or no glucose, they can't burn anything and they can't generate oxygen. Now there are some exceptions and the muscles for example can briefly burn glucose without the presence of oxygen but at the end of the day for long-term survival you need to have glucose and oxygen to produce energy and if there's no energy there's no life. Blood transports these substances to the target organs the vessels of the past that are used to deliver them, and the heart's the pumping mechanism. So any problem with any of these three areas, the blood, the vessels of the heart, you'll get shock. So if the blood can't carry nutrients, there's either not enough of it, or there are issues with the way those nutrients are being delivered to the blood, then you've got shock. If the vessel volume changes radically, and there's too much vessel volume for too little blood volume and the body can't deliver those nutrients, you've got shock. And if the heart doesn't pump regularly or if it's not pumping well, you've got shock. So flow, blood flow, essentially is perfusion in this model. And we can sort of parse out of that if you don't have enough oxygen in the blood or you don't have enough glucose in the blood. We'll talk about those, but for most of the models of shock that we're concerned about, blood flow, flow is perfusion. So if you've got adequate flow, you've got adequate perfusion. And if you have inadequate flow, then you have inadequate perfusion, and if you combine our prefixes and root words, that's hypoperfusion. So we're talking about inadequate tissue perfusion or hypoperfusion of the end organs and that shock. So as we, with a few exceptions, uh, low oxygen, low glucose, almost every other type of shock is caused by inadequate blood flow for problems either of blood volume, vessel volume, or the heart's ability to pump. There are many, many different types of shock but I'd like you to remember these. These are common types of shock and these are ones that you will be called upon at some point in your career to address not necessarily all of them but many of them in one way or another. And the mnemonic for it is RN CHAMPS so RN is short for registered nurse so RN CHAMPS respiratory shock, neurogenic shock, cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic and as a subset of hypovolemic hemorrhagic shock anaphylactic shock, metabolic shock, psychogenic shock, and septic shock. So in respiratory shock, you have failure of the respiratory system. And what we're talking about specifically is the pulmonary respiratory system, although there is a cellular respiratory system as well. And that can 
also fail and I'll mention that briefly so you get limited or no oxygen delivery to the bloodstream typically so someone's not breathing well they're they've got pulmonary edema they've got as an asthma attack they can't deliver oxygen to their bloodstream well if they can't deliver oxygen to the bloodstream they can't circulate it and if they can't circulate it they can't perfuse their organs And if they can't perfuse their organs they're in shock so that's the type of respiratory failure we typically think about but others like carbon monoxide poisoning where carbon monoxide outcompetes the oxygen to bind to the hemoglobin in your red blood cells that's another form of respiratory shock it's a toxic respiratory shock but it's failure of your respiratory system to be able to deliver oxygen to the cells you can get plenty into your lungs it's hanging out there ready to go into the blood and the alveoli but it's out competed by the carbon monoxide and some toxins like cyanide actually poison the cells respiratory system so at the cellular level the cell can't use oxygen and so those would be types of respiratory shock although we think of them as a toxic type of respiratory shock in neurogenic shock you have a spinal cord injury this is discussed quite a bit more in the spinal injuries lecture but the basics are that your spinal cord always triggers is constantly triggering your adrenal glands to release epinephrine and norepinephrine or adrenaline and noradrenaline and those maintain two things they maintain some vascular tone so your blood vessels are always slightly more constricted or moderately more constricted than they would be without this tone and they also keep your heart rate beating in its normal range it's kind of triggering the heart a bit and that's called your sympathetic tone and if you get a spinal cord injury and you lose sympathetic tone so you're no longer triggering the adrenals the blood vessels dilate because they now no longer have that sympathetic tone so they get bigger what happens when you increase the volume of a container without increasing the volume of the contents of the container you decrease the pressure so the pressure of blood flow decreases so the vessels will dilate and the skin will remain warm which is unusual in shock also your heart is controlled not just by the sympathetic tone but also by what's called vagal tone and the vagal tone works opposite of sympathetic tone it decreases your heart rate and so if suddenly you take away your sympathetic tone you have unopposed vagal tone and the heart rate slows down so these patients in shock have low blood pressures with warm skin and bradycardia which is a very unusual looking presentation in cardiogenic shock you have pump failure and the heart's output depends what we call cardiac output depends on how often the heart beats and how much blood volume it's putting out so your heart rate and your contractility so either a rate or contractility problem can cause pump failure so either an irregular heartbeat or a heart attack we think about heart failure acute heart failure in terms of the acute myocardial infarct the acute heart attack so suddenly some section of the heart's wall is no longer squeezing particularly on the left side and so the blood's not pushed forward and it backs up into the lungs and they get acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema their blood pressure drops these patients are incredibly sick but very low heart rates obviously could decrease your cardiac output that makes sense if cardiac output is just your volume times your your volume times your heart rate but very fast heart rates can also cause cardiogenic shock and they do that by not allowing the heart enough time to refill so even though you're contracting okay and even though your rates high your actual volume of blood being pushed forward drops to the point where it's just not effective at all in hypovolemic shock you lose volume you essentially blood volume either whole blood so all the blood components the red blood cells the platelets the proteins everything in the blood or just plasma so in in trauma you've got whole blood loss in burns you lose a lot of plasma with vomiting diarrhea increased urine output increased respiratory losses you lose a lot of free water from your body and you're to compensate for that you shift water out of your blood vessels you do what's called third spacing and you end up losing plasma volume in your bloodstream
in anaphylactic shock, the body has a severe allergic reaction. It overreacts to some innocuous or minimally dangerous uh, allergen in foreign invader. And the body releases a lot of histamine so that the immune system can get to that spot. Well, what does histamine do to help the immune system get to where it's needed? Although in this case, it's not really needed. Uh, the histamine causes <clears throat> blood vessels to dilate. So you've got now big blood vessels and haven't changed your volume. And so your pressure drops. So that decreases perfusion. And then the blood vessels become leaky because you want everything to be able to get out of the vessels to the area of the invader. Again, not necessary in this case, but would be necessarily in a normal response to an infection. And so they become leaky, and so now you lose blood volume. So now, not only do you have big blood vessels, you've lost volume, and that's sort of a double hit on uh, being able to perfuse. And sort of in a tertiary way, anaphylactic shock will also cause a respiratory shock by causing the airways to constrict. You get constriction of the bronchi or bronchoconstriction and then you end up with a respiratory failure as well, uh, respiratory shock and inability to deliver oxygen to this low blood volume in a big, in a big uh, vessel space volume anyway and so it's sort of a triple whammy. In metabolic shock, you have some sort of hormonal disorder of any of your uh, endocrine glands. Um, we think about the adrenals, the pancreas, the thyroid also compromises either nutrients in the bloodstream or flow or vessel capacity. And the, the obvious one here is the patient who's a diabetic, takes too much insulin, and the blood sugar drops. So that's a pancreas problem. Um, or related to a pancreas metabolic hormonal disorder, and the blood sugar drops. So you just simply aren't delivering glucose. The vessels are fine, the blood volume's fine, the heart's pushing forward, but you don't actually have the glucose to deliver. So it's sort of analogous to respiratory shock. The system's intact, you just aren't loading the nutrients onto the, onto the, into the blood, and they're not making it to the organs. So that's sort of the obvious one, but some of the less obvious ones, the adrenal glands, we talked about their effect in neurogenic shock. They can be injured for other reasons as well, and so you can end up with dilation of the vessels, uh, loss of your sympathetic tone. In hyperthyroidism, the thyroid controls your metabolism, the thyroid hormones, and so if you have a problem with the thyroid, you have hyperthyroidism, too many, you increase your heart rate, your body's breaking itself down, and eventually you go into heart failure from that, and that can be fatal. And it's something that develops over time and then gets worse, and the patient's got a high heart rate, not so much from the shock, although it starts to contribute, but from this hypermetabolic state, and they've wasted all their nutrients, and um, it's a real problem. Psychogenic shock is syncope, just fainting. Uh, stress, pain, fright are typically the causes, although uh, it's sort of a diagnosis of exclusion. A cardiogenic shock from an irregular heartbeat could also make you pass out. But in this case, we're talking about simple psychogenic shock. Um, you have this event that really bothers you, either consciously or unconsciously. You're vessels all dilate and your heart rate slows down. And this is an absolutely silly anti-Darwinian response because if the saber-toothed tiger suddenly appears behind the bush and you pass out, you're dinner. So this is kind of selective against people who, who have syncope um, from psychogenic shock. But at any rate, the brain becomes hypoperfused and you become unconscious. Now the big plus to this is it's self-correcting. So you're standing up, it's hard for the blood to get to your brain. You suddenly are hypoperfusing your brain. You pass out. What happens when you pass out? You fall to the ground. Your head is now level with your heart and your toes. There's no greater difficulty in getting the blood to your brain. And so you now are able to adequately perfuse your brain. In septic shock, you have an infection. And kind of like an anaphylaxis, the body responds to the infection, which is appropriate, but may have an excessive response, uh, system, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, where the response itself 
does many of the same things we see in anaphylactic shock. You've got the blood vessels dilating. You've got them becoming very leaky so the immune system can get to where it needs to to fight the infection. The problem is, is if you have a systemic infection, you're fighting it all over your body, and you're going to end up with the systemic response and shock from basically volume and uh, and blood vessel caliber issues and ultimately depending on what toxins are being released you can come up with heart come into heart failure and respiratory failure as well so it can be multifactorial of all the diseases uh, shock states you're going to see hypovolemic shock is going to be the most common and so as we talk a little bit about shock physiology from here that's what we're going to focus on uh, hemorrhage from trauma that's what you're going to see in your younger population or hemorrhage from medical illness. So the 23-year-old female with an ectopic pregnancy that ruptures and suddenly has a belly full of blood or the 62-year-old three-pack-a-day smoker who has abdominal pain and suddenly their uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm ruptures and they die from bleeding to death into their abdomen. Dehydration, which is the leading cause of death in children worldwide. Number one reason why kids die is dehydration. And so that can, in, in a first world country, uh, on board the ship, where you have the ability to start IVs and give anti-nausea medications, this shouldn't cause someone's death. But it is a possibility, and you need to be aware of that. And then other fluid losses from burns uh, or other causes. So using hypovolemic shock as the model, we talk about compensated or compensatory shock in which you have essentially a 15 percent volume loss and that could be true volume loss it could be a relative volume loss that is a, a roughly 15 percent increase in your vascular capacity the size of the blood vessels but at any rate the body increases the heart rate and then tries to squeeze down the blood vessels as well increase vascular resistance so in your hypovolemic shock patient this is what you're going to see An, a slight increase in heart rate and a slight decrease in blood flow to organs like your skin and your muscles and your hands. So it's sacrificing some organs to protect others. And this may also be a good protective mechanism. If the, the cause of bleeding is an injury to your arm, if I can decrease blood flow to the arm enough to let the body clot off, well that's a really great thing. That might actually save your life. So this is a this is a relatively adaptive mechanism. Between 15 and 20 percent of your volume you transition into the next stage of shock. And so in an adult that's about a liter of fluid. So that 15 percent uh, is somewhere between 500 mLs and a liter in most adults. We have about a five to six liter circulating blood volume. Uh, it's a half a liter in children and in infants it's a tiny amount of blood, 50 to 70 mL. We're talking 20 percent blood volume. So that's now decompensated or decompensating shock. So you've got a 15 to 30 percent volume loss and the body begins to not, no longer be able to compensate. And what were we doing when we were compensating? We were directing blood to our brain, to our heart, to our lungs, to our vital organs, cutting off blood to other areas and increasing our cardiac output a little bit by increasing our rate. Well now our rate goes way up. We can no longer perfuse our brain so we have altered mental status. Initially our blood pressure is normal and then very late when we really decompensate our blood pressure drops. We get hypotension. We, we feel short of breath. We have dyspnea because we're not delivering enough oxygen to our vital tissues. So our body's saying more oxygen, more oxygen. We're hypoperfused. We're in shock. And our kidneys say wow, we need to keep in all the volume we can, and so they decrease urine output. Now, are you going to see this initially in your patient? No, because the bladder stores plenty of urine. You don't know if it's full or not. But if you're taking care of a patient who's had an injury or a burn over 24 hours, and you're tracking their urine output, which you should be doing as part of their nursing care, you will discover between shifts that the amount of urine they're producing is going down and going down and going down and that's a sign of significant shock. In lethal or fatal shock you really can't perfuse your vital organs at all. The pump fails, the heart 
goes from being fast. Now we've, we've burned out all our mechanisms for trying to increase our cardiac output and the heart rate slows. This happens very early in children and uh, that's an ominous sign. The patient has no perfusion to the brains, they're comatose, and there's essentially no survivability. Could it happen that these patients would survive if they were, say, a trauma patient and they were at a trauma center and could get blood products and go right to the operating room and have whatever the hole is plugged? Yeah, it's a possibility, although there probably would be some brain injury from inadequate perfusion, hypoxia, et cetera. Um, but in the shipboard environment or the remote environment, if you have a patient with uh, greater than 30% blood volume loss and they're unresponsive and their heart rate is low, uh, chances are good they're going to die. So again, shock is not a disease and it occurs in the context of another disease. So to recognize it, first you have to know that there's even something wrong with your patient. You've got to figure out that their complaint means something. There's, there's something going on. You perform your initial history and physical. You do an assessment and you always, always, every patient you see, you always have shock in the back of your mind. Does this patient have inadequate end organ perfusion? So look for symptoms and signs. And if the patient is unresponsive and they've got a pool of blood beside them, that's easy. And if you missed that, I mean, I don't know what to say. You, you've, missed, you've missed a lot of your medical training. I'm not worried about you missing that. You're going to get those. That's, shock is going to be right there. It's the subtle early shock. It's the patient who had a fall and struck their left upper abdomen. And you see them at time 10 minutes after the event. And their heart rate is 85, and they have a normal blood pressure, and their respiratory rate is 18, and they're complaining of some pain in their abdomen. And you get them to the aid room, and you re-examine them. Their heart rate's 95, blood pressure's normal, respiratory rate's 20. And then you check another set of vitals half an hour later, and their heart rate's 102, and they're a little bit irritable at you. Can't you do something? I'm really uncomfortable. Can you help me? That, that's those subtle changes, that's what you need to be looking for. Because if you sit on that patient, you don't arrange evacuation, and you don't get your IVs now, and you aren't ready to take care of them when they crash, they're going to suddenly crump on you, and they're going to die, and you're not going to be able to take care of them because you missed the early signs of shock. So recognize shock so that your patients survive. Typical signs and symptoms. The symptoms include anxiety and restlessness, that change of blood flow to the brain, the, the release of the adrenaline and the noradrenaline because the body's trying to respond to an injury. And if people aren't fighting or fleeing, they're going to feel restless and anxious. They may have a feeling of impending doom. It's, it's interesting, but that's people actually get that feeling with severe illness, particularly shock. They may be confused. They may feel dizzy or lightheaded. They may feel nauseated. Um, and oftentimes they'll feel thirsty because the body recognizes that it's losing volume. And how does it replace volume? It replaces volume by drinking fluids. So there's this imperative to drink. Um, typically you would not allow these patients to drink, but we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Signs, they may be agitated and confused. The pupils may be dilated because of the release of the adrenaline. The eyes may appear dull. Um, they may have sweaty skin because that's a really good mechanism for responding to being attacked by something. If you get all sweaty, it's hard for, uh, it's hard for a bear to grab onto you, so you can wrestle your way away, away from it and run away. You may start vomiting. The patient may be vomiting. They may have pale, cool skin, um, shallow and rapid breathing. They're trying to get more oxygen in. They may have a rapid pulse early on. And it may feel weak to you because if they're peripherally vasoconstricting, they're decreasing blood flow to their extremities. So even if their core blood pressure is normal, they're already sacrificing their limbs to protect their core, their vital organs. And so the pulse may feel weak to you. Uh, tracking them over time, they'll have the decreased urine output. And late in the game, they'll have a low or falling blood pressure. And you trend this, and it's the trend that really matters. In hypovolemic shock, you're going to see sort of the classic picture of shock, a, a weak rapid pulse and pale, cool, clammy skin. In cardiogenic shock, because the shock may be caused by a heart rate problem, they may have a weak rapid pulse or a weak slow pulse, but they'll also tend to be pale and cool and clammy. Uh, 
in neuro neurogenic shock, they'll have a weak, slow pulse because of that increased vagal tone and dry, flush skin because of the vasodilation. And these are patients who present immediately with low blood pressure because they have no way to compensate for it. They go immediately into a decompensated shock phase uh, because of that dilation and the inability to increase their heart rate. And then in sepsis and anaphylaxis, you get a weak, rapid pulse, and often you'll have dry, flushed skin because you also get blood vessel dilation. And so it'll be maybe red in appearance. It often is with anaphylaxis. You'll even see the hives, the urticaria. And hopefully they'll also be itchy because that's a nice clue for you. And they'll develop wheezing and difficulty breathing from the bronchospasm. So if you see those findings, think anaphylactic shock. Although, again, you have to think about could there be other causes of shock as well because they may not have all the classic findings. That low blood pressure is a late sign. Uh, it means that your defense mechanisms are exhausted. Now, in neurogenic shock, where you get vasodilation, and in anaphylactic and even in septic shock, where you get vasodilation, you may see that earlier rather than later. Um, also, in patients with comorbid disease, heart disease, or they're on medications that don't let their heart rate speed up, beta blockers or calcium channel blockers for high blood pressure, they may present with hypotension early because they can't increase their heart rate. Now the scary thing is they may not present with hypotension and they may present with a normal heart rate because they can't increase their heart rate and then suddenly crump on you much faster than you would expect. So if somebody's on uh, a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker type blood pressure medication, uh, then even if their heart rate's normal, you need to be suspicious. And in an infant or child, when they get hypotensive, it's a near-death state. In an adult, if it's associated with alteration in mental status, it's a near-death state. So the first thing to do is make sure you're not going to become a victim of whatever got this person ill. X, A, B, C, D, E, F. And frankly, you're probably, if they're really sick, if they're in decompensated shock, you're not going to get past X, A, B, C, D, E, F. You're going to be doing that until you evacuate them or they die. Administer high flow oxygen, 15 liters per minute via a non rebreather, or use a bag valve mask to support their ventilation if they're in respiratory distress or respiratory failure. Reassure and calm the patient and have them lie down. Um, we no longer elevate the feet. Uh, that's not really an effective technique for impro improving perfusion. And uh, because you shift the abdominal organs up against the diaphragm, you compromise their ability to breathe. Keep the patient warm. Don't overheat them. You don't want to force them to vasodilate if they're in hypovolemic shock. And now you make them really warm so all their blood vessels dilate and all that blood rushes away from the core to the periphery. If it's a traumatic injury, NPO, uh, non paras, nothing to eat or drink, um, because they're going to need, uh, they're going to need probably operative management, management in an operating room, and the, the anesthesiologists prefer they not have had anything to eat or drink for eight hours before they go to the operating room. Plus, they're at risk for vomiting and airway compromise. If it's dehydration from diarrhea or nausea and vomiting, then anti-nausea medicines and lots of oral fluid is going to be the appropriate choice. But discuss this with medical control. While they're in shock or while you're concerned about it, vital signs every five minutes, and get an IV, preferably two, in now in the early stages before they decompensate. Because when they really peripherally vasoconstrict, you're not going to be able to find any veins to get IVs into. So get them in early. Contact medical control about whether or not you need to evacuate the patient. And in most cases, if they're in shock, they're going to need to be evacuated. Again, dehydration or anaphylaxis might be exceptions to that. Also, uh, the, the asthmatic and mild respiratory failure that you turn around or the, the hypoglycemic diabetic. But talk to medical control and explain to the patient what you're doing, even if they're unconscious, because hearing is the last sense to go. And so if you keep talking to them, they'll, they'll hear, may hear what you're saying. You're going to treat the shock, obviously, with fluid replacement if they need it.
but make sure that you're also treating the cause. So for example, in anaphylaxis, if you don't treat the immune system overreaction, you're not going to stop the shock. You can temporize it, but you won't make the symptoms go away. The shock's a response to a disease process, and it's not the disease itself. So you stabilize the shock. Now obviously, if someone's got bleeding from a liver laceration, you are not going to fix that. That needs bright lights and cold steel. They need to go to an operating room. But you need to recognize that that what's need is the thing that needs to happen, and you, your treatment of that is to evacuate them to a hospital. In respiratory failure, bag valve mask, neurogenic, immobilize them, expand their intravascular volume with fluids, cardiogenic, if they've got an irregular heartbeat, you may be able to treat that, talk to medical control, evacuate if they have pump failure, you think they're having a heart attack or uh, congestive heart failure. In non-hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock, replace the fluid volume. So someone's got nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and a low blood pressure, you can tank them right up. If it's hemorrhagic shock, control all controllable external bleeding. People forget to do that, and people bleed to death from scalp wounds or extremity wounds. Uh, We've had patients bleed to death from leaking varicose veins because they didn't control the bleeding and they went to bed and, and then they died in their sleep. Make sure that you target to maintain a systolic, systolic blood pressure between 80 and 90 millimeters mercury for uncontrollable bleeding. Uh, don't go too high because you don't want to wash clots out um, and increase the bleeding. But if you can maintain a systolic blood pressure of 80 to 90 with IV fluid administration, normal saline or lactate ringers, uh, then you'll perfuse the brain and the heart and your vital organs. Anaphylactic shock, epinephrine, intramuscular, and you may need to do this multiple times. Uh, histamine blockers, both H1 like diphenhydramine and H2 like ranitidine uh, or the other H2 type blockers. Steroids and expand their intravascular volume to fill up that Oh, those dilated vessels. In metabolic shock, treat hypoglycemia. So if the blood sugar is low, fix that. And otherwise, talk to medical control. Psychogenic, of course, is self-correcting. Just don't let them injure themselves. If you're by somebody and they're having uh, what appears to be a fainting episode, psychogenic shock, don't let them hit their head on the floor and get another injury. Septic, you're going to treat the infection, so antibiotics and lots and lots of IV fluids, and you are going to evacuate them so fast. Remember again, I expect you, I would have expected you before you started this course to recognize an unconscious patient with a low blood pressure as being really, really sick, and now you know that that's called shock. I want you to be able to recognize people in very early compensated shock begin your treatment early before they get that sick. The falling blood pressure is a late sign. It means you are way, way behind. Don't get there. Identify that shock early. Please complete any associated knowledge reviews. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact your professor or instructor. Thank you very much.